Minimally, a libertarian municipalist economics calls for the municipalization of the economy, not its centralization into a state-owned nationalized enterprise on one hand, or its reduction to worker-controlled forms of collectivistic capitalism on the other. Trade union-directed worker-controlled enterprises, that is, syndicalism, has had its day. This should be evident to anyone who examines the bureaucracies that even revolutionary trade unions spawned during the Spanish Civil War of 1936. Today, corporate capitalism is increasingly eager to bring workers into complicity with their own exploitation by means of workplace democracy. Nor was the revolution in Spain and other countries spared the existence of competition among worker-controlled enterprises for raw materials, markets and profits. Even more recently, many Israeli kibbutzim have been failures as examples of non-exploitative, need-oriented enterprises, despite the high ideals with which they were initially founded. Libertarian municipalism proposes a radically different form of economy, one that is neither nationalised nor collectivised according to syndicalist precepts. It proposes that land and enterprises be placed increasingly in the custody of the community, more precisely the custody of citizens in free assemblies and their deputies in confederal councils. What technology should be used, how goods should be distributed are questions that can only be resolved in practice. The maxim, from each according to his or her ability, to each according to his or her needs, would seem a bedrock guide for an economically rational society, provided that goods are of the highest durability and quality, that needs are guided by rational and ecological standards, and that the ancient notion of limit and balance replace the bourgeois marketplace imperative of growth or die. In such a municipal economy, confederal, interdependent and rational by ecological, not simply technological standards, we would expect that the special interests that divide people today into workers, professionals, managers and the like would be melded into a general interest in which people see themselves as citizens guided strictly by the needs of their community and region rather than by personal proclivities and vocational concerns. Here, citizens would come into its own and rational as well as ecological interpretations of the public good would supplant class and hierarchical interests. This is the moral basis of a moral economy for moral communities, but of overarching importance is the general social interest that potentially underpins all moral communities, an interest that must ultimately cut across class, gender, ethnic and status lines if humanity is to continue to exist as a viable species. In our times, this common interest is posed by ecological catastrophe, Capitalism's grow-or-die imperative stands radically at odds with ecology's imperative of interdependence and limit. The two imperatives can no longer coexist with each other, nor can any society founded on the myth that they can be reconciled hope to survive. Either we will establish an ecological society, or society will go under for everyone, irrespective of his or her status. Will this ecological society be authoritarian, or possibly even totalitarian, a hierarchical dispensation that is implicit in the image of the planet as a spaceship, or will it be democratic? If history is any guide, the development of a democratic ecological society, as distinguished from a command ecological society, must follow its own logic. One cannot resolve this historical dilemma without getting to its roots. Without a searching analysis of our ecological problems and their social sources, the pernicious institutions that we have now will lead to increased centralization and further ecological catastrophe. In a democratic ecological society, those roots are literally the grassroots that libertarian municipalism seeks to foster. For those who rightly call for a new technology, new sources of energy, new means of transportation, and new ecological lifeways, can a new society be anything less than a community of communities based on confederation rather than statism? We already live in a world in which the economy is over-globalised, over-centralised and over-bureaucratised. Much that can be done locally and regionally is now being done largely for profit, military needs and imperial appetites, on a global scale with a seeming complexity that can actually be easily diminished. If this seems too utopian, so-called, for our time, 
and so must the present flood of literature that asks for radically sweeping shifts in energy policies, far-reaching reductions in air and water pollution, and the formulation of worldwide plans to arrest global warming and the destruction of the ozone layer. Is it too much to take such demands one step further and call for institutional and economic changes that are no less drastic and that, in fact, are seemingly sedimented in the noblest democratic political traditions of both America and indeed the world? Nor are we obliged to expect these changes to occur immediately. The left long worked with minimum and maximum programs of change, in which immediate steps that can be taken now were linked by transitional advances and intermediate areas that would eventually yield ultimate goals. Minimal steps that can be taken now include initiating left-green municipalist movements that propose popular neighbourhood and town assemblies, even if they have only moral functions at first, and electing town and city councillors that advance the cause of these assemblies and other popular institutions. These minimal steps can progressively lead to the formation of confederal bodies and the increasing legitimation of truly democratic bodies, civic banks to fund municipal enterprises and land purchases, the fostering of new ecologically oriented enterprises owned by the community and the creation of grassroots networks in many fields of endeavour and the public wheel, all these can be developed at a pace appropriate to changes being made in political life. That capital will likely migrate from communities and confederations that are moving toward libertarian municipalism is a problem faced by every community, every nation whose political life has become radicalised. Capital, in fact, normally migrates to areas where it can acquire higher profits, irrespective of political considerations. Overwhelmed by fears of capital flight, a good case could be established for not rocking the political boat at any time. More to the point, municipally owned farms and enterprises could provide new ecologically valuable and health nourishing products to a public becoming increasingly aware of the low quality goods and staples being foisted on it now. Libertarian municipalism is a politics that can excite the public imagination, appropriate for a movement direly in need of a sense of direction and purpose. Libertarian municipalism offers ideas, ways and means not only to undo the present social order, but to remake it drastically, expanding its residual democratic traditions into a rational and ecological society. Thus, libertarian municipalism is not merely an effort simply to take over city councils, to construct a more environmentally friendly city government, such an approach in effect views the civic structures that exist now, and essentially all rhetoric to the contrary aside, takes them as they exist. Libertarian municipalism, by contrast, is an effort to transform and democratise city governments, to root them in public assemblies, to knit them together along confederal lines, to appropriate a regional economy along confederal and municipal lines. In fact, Libertarian municipalism gains its life and its integrity precisely from the dialectical tension it proposes between the nation-state and the municipal confederation. Its law of life, to use an old Marxian term, consists precisely in its struggle with the state. The tension between municipal confederations and the state must be clear and uncompromising. Since these confederations would exist primarily in opposition to statecraft, they cannot be compromised by state, provincial or national elections, much less achieved by these means. Libertarian municipalism is formed by its struggle with the state, strengthened by this struggle, indeed defined by this struggle, divested of this dialectical tension with the state. Libertarian municipalism becomes little more than sewer socialism. Many comrades who are prepared to one day do battle with the cosmic forces of capitalism, find that libertarian municipalism is too thorny, irrelevant or vague and opt instead for what is basically a form of political particularism. Such radicals may choose to brush libertarian municipalism aside as a ludicrous tactic in inverted commas, but it never ceases to amaze me that revolutionaries who are committed to the overthrow of capitalism find it too difficult to function politically including electorally in their own neighbourhoods for a new politics based on genuine democracy. If they cannot provide a transformative politics for their own neighbourhood, 
a relatively modest task or diligently work at doing so with the constancy that used to mark the left movements of the past, I find it very hard to believe that they will ever do much harm to the present social system. Indeed, by creating cultural centres, parks and good housing, they may well be improving the system by giving capitalism a human face without diminishing its underlying unfreedom as a hierarchical and class society. A range of struggles for identity has often fractured rising radical movements since SDS in the 1960s, ranging from foreign to domestic nationalisms. Because these identity struggles are so popular today, some critics of libertarian municipalism invoke public opinion against it. But when has it been the task of revolutionaries to surrender to public opinion? Not even the public opinion of the oppressed, whose views can often be very reactionary. Truth has its own life. Regardless of whether the oppressed masses perceive or agree on what is true, nor is it elitist to invoke truth in contradiction to even radical public opinion, when that opinion essentially seeks a march backward into the politics of particularism and even racism. We must challenge the existing society on behalf of our shared common humanity, not on the basis of gender, race, age and the like. Critics of libertarian municipalism dispute even the very possibility of a general interest. If the face-to-face -face democracy advocated by libertarian municipalism and the need to extend the premises of democracy beyond mere justice to complete freedom did not suffice as general interest, it would seem to me that the need to repair our relationship with the natural world is certainly a general interest that is beyond dispute, and it remains the general interest advanced by social ecology. It may be possible to co-opt many dissatisfied elements in the present society, but nature is not co-optable. Indeed, the only politics that remains for the left is one based on the premise that there is a general interest in democratising society and preserving the planet. Now that traditional forces, such as the workers' movement, have ebbed from the historical scene, it can be said with almost complete certainty that without a politics akin to libertarian municipalism, the left will have no politics whatever. A dialectical view of the relationship of confederalism to the nation-state, an understanding of the narrowness, introverted character and parochialism of identity movements, and a recognition that the workers' movement is essentially dead, all illustrate that if a new politics is going to develop today, it must be unflinchingly public, in contrast to the alternative cafe politics advanced by many radicals today. It must be electoral, on a municipal basis, confederal in its vision and revolutionary in its character. Indeed, confederal libertarian municipalism is precisely the commune of communes for which anarchists have fought over the past two centuries. Today, it is the red button that must be pushed if a radical movement is to open the door to the public sphere. To leave that button untouched and slip back into the worst habits of the post-1968 new left, when the notion of power was divested of utopian and imaginative qualities, is to reduce radicalism to yet another subculture that will probably live more on heroic memories than on the hopes of a rational future.